Well, how are you feeling about the new year? <laughs> kind of a bit of this, a bit of that. Um, uh, I just was looking at the um, news yesterday and saw rumours of a triple dip recession. Don't know how you feel about that. Um, and uh, there are kind of various things that there are kind of pressures on us that um, uh, are kind of pressures that we feel um, and uh, kind of a stirring often behind the scenes. We don't like to actually face them directly, but nevertheless, they're there. And I'd love to just show you some statistics that um, I was looking at on the uh, uh, web on Friday. Um, so it's up to date as of Friday. So here's some statistics. So we are one trillion pounds in debt in the UK. It's quite difficult to imagine that. That's nine noughts, 1.1 trillion um, and uh, in debt, that's quite a lot. That's, um, you think your debt problems are bad, that's a major debt problem. Um, there are 44.8 billion pounds in interest payments that are, um, uh, are being, uh, need to be paid each year. Um, the average household debt is 53,912 pounds in the UK. Um, every day, Every day, the government will borrow another £277 million. Pounds. So tomorrow, they'll be doing that um, for just to keep the country going. Um, tomorrow, uh, £1.3 billion will be spent on plastic card purchases in the UK. That's quite a lot, isn't it? Slightly nerve-wracking, nerve that, when you think about the figures. Um, 1,400 people are going to be made redundant. £166 million pounds is going to be spent on interest on personal debt. 8,465 new debt problems are going to be taken to the Citizens Advice Bureau tomorrow. That's the average. Every day, new debt problems. 307 people will be declared insolvent or bankrupt tomorrow on average. So there's quite a lot going on, isn't there? There's quite a few things that we might need to be concerned about in our nation, and that's kind of um, standard stuff, really. So, um, but it's easy to think, okay, we've got hard times. Just think about it globally. Uh, someone gave me um, this idea. They pointed me to Hungry Planet, which is a photography exhibition. And this um, is by a guy called Peter Menzel. He follows families in different places in the world, um, different countries, and says, OK, how much do people spend on a weekly amount of food? And so this is in the UK, this family of four. They spend £155 per week on food um, for their family. Now, if you take that to other countries, well, Bhutan, for example, here's a Bhutanese family. Um, Look at the chap on the left smiling. He seems to be having a good time. Um, 13 in that family. The average they spend per week on food is three pounds per week. You think that's not very much. Go to Chad. And in Chad, this family is going to spend 77p on food this week in order to feed their family. Now, there's no doubt that in this country we face different issues and different challenges. Life is challenging with the bombardment of adverts and pressures on us as families, as individuals. Um, the standard of living is higher, so things cost more in this country. Inflation is, um, you know, is always a threat, and there are, things just seem to be getting more and more expensive. How are we to live our lives in this age? How are we to live our lives in 2013 with some of the pressures that are on us? Jesus' words in John 10, verse 10, that we might have life and have it abundantly. That's one of the reasons he's come. How can we lead and live abundant lives? How can we enjoy life today rather than being under the pressure and kind of the, the, these kind of looming threats that we've been um, thinking about just already. New Year's a great time to think about these things, a great time to set goals, a great time to kind of explore these things and to particularly reflect on, uh, on where we are personally, if you like doing your own personal inventory. And um, 
this month, we're going to be looking in this series of New Year Revolution at a number of different things. Today, we're looking at contentment. How can we live with contentment? We're going to be exploring practical um, wisdom. Uh, we're going to be looking at organization. We're going to be looking at generosity. We're going to be looking at social justice. Getting our heads straight at the beginning of 2013, so our perspective is right, so our priorities are right. It fits with our theme this year. Today, we're kicking off another kind of longer series for the whole year, which is a year of discipleship. We want to, we're kind of calling it Invest 2013. Last year, we looked at evangelism. We haven't stopped doing that. We've just kind of begun to kind of get that under our belt. We want to keep on doing Alpha. We want to keep on having our connect groups, having an outward focus. We want to keep on um, learning and, and growing and sharing our faith with others. But this year, we want to take it one step deeper and say, actually, let's have a year of intentional discipleship where we want to invest in our own walk as disciples. And of course, Jesus calls us to make disciples. So we want to invest in us making disciples of one another and those we encounter. So that's the kind of big picture. So today, how can we be content? Well, in this amazing reading, Jesus looks at three kinds of life that... Um, uh, we could choose to lead. The first kind of life is a dissatisfied life. How to lead a dissatisfied life. Jesus tells us how to do that. If you look at verse 15 of chapter 12, Luke 12, Jesus says, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. You know, he says watch out because it's easy for us to get embroiled with all kinds of greed. Greed, the word here is insatiable desire. But he, uh, it kind of covers all kinds of greed. Greed is something that is very subtle. It's, it's kind of looming at the door all the time. And this, um, st the guy in the story, Farmer Barnes, we'll call him, um, he doesn't know the kind of trouble He's in. He's not in a connect group, so he hasn't got anyone to be accountable to. He can't kind of live his life with other Christians um, who um, he can follow Jesus and learn how to follow Jesus. He's not in a small group within that connect group, so there's no trust that's built up with other friends where he can actually trust them enough to be challenged by them and say, actually, you're right. You know, I want to change my life. We notice here, actually, there's no reference to any other people in this story. He is a lonely person. He's just consumed with his own agenda, his own life. He's more interested in treasure, growing his own resources without a thought for others. He's more interested in pleasure. He says, eat, drink, and be merry. He's more interested in leisure. Take life easy. These are the focuses of his life. Now, in and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with um, storing up uh, things for the future. We're commanded, actually, encouraged to do that in, in um, Proverbs. There's um, nothing wrong with leisure. There's nothing wrong with pleasure. These are good things. But when they are the only thing, when they're the main thing, that's when there's a problem. And that was Farmer Barnes's problem. He thought, I mean, he got into uh, this situation where there was an insatiable desire for more. More, more, more. He was not content. And if something becomes an insatiable desire, it's greed. One of the deadly sins. He thought, well, he never thought, what's going to happen when I die? It didn't even occur to him. Every one of us is going to die, 100%. one of those um, ultimate statistics. But God had different plans for Farmer Barnes. He was going to die that night. And Jesus says, if you don't think, if you think in this way, you're a fool. You're a fool. And so are we if our priorities are wrong. It's subtle. We can be greedy for food. We can be greedy for ambition. We can be greedy for sex. We can be greedy for attention be noticed. 
Our whole culture encourages self-sufficiency. It encourages um, satisfaction and selfishness. That's what all the adverts are about. How few are about giving it away. There's a New York um, phone company analysis that was made a few years ago about the particular words that are used in phone conversations. And the number one word was I. I love the story of um, Samuel Butler who tells of um, two people that he knew who were the most selfish people he had come across. They were Mr. and Mrs. Carlyle. And he said, how good of God to let the two marry each other and so make just two people miserable instead of four. (laughs) The antidote to greed is found in Jesus. St. Augustine discovered that himself. When he was converted, he said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. To lead a dissatisfied life, all you need to do is put yourself first and don't worry about anything else. The second kind of life Jesus addresses is how to lead a miserable life. He goes on to teach about worry. If there's one sure way to have a miserable life, it's to be full of worry and fear. Do you know um, the, uh, uh, what lies at the bottom of the ocean and quivers? It's a nervous wreck. There we go. Worry is a very strong feeling of anxiety. It's the fear of the unknown. It's the thought that the worst will happen. When we worry, we think bad things are going to happen. That's what we're thinking about. But fear can grip every one of us in different ways. Sometimes very subtle. People worry about the future. People worry about personal security. People worry about money and income. People worry about what other people think. Just look at these um, statistics. An average person's anxiety, this has been done um, uh, on a number of different uh, uh, measures. Let's just have the next slide. So an average person's anxiety is focused on these things. So 40% of the things we are worried about will never actually happen. 30%, another 30% of those things that we worry about are things in the past that we can't change. 12% of things we worry about are about criticism from others, most of which are untrue, but we're still worried about it. 10% of our worries are around health, um, which gets worse with stress and anxiety. And 8% are real problems that will be faced. 8% out of 100 real things that might concern us, that we will face. It's amazing how anxiety and worry can grip us. And Jesus speaks right into our lives in um, this passage. And he encourages us to take three ways to um, avoid anxiety. First one is to be obedient. Look at that command. He says, do not worry. Do not worry. Verse 22. It's a command. When God gives a command, it's worth following. If God is saying, do this, it's really worth doing it. If you don't, you will get into trouble. It will be difficult for us. And sadly, we worry a lot. So we find it difficult. We get into that trouble. But be obedient. That's the first thing we can do. Is actually say, okay, I'm going to do what you say. I'm going to decide not to worry. Second reason he gives is to be logical. He's got two threads here. Verse 24, if God can look after ravens, they're dirty birds, so they're kind of um, seen as not being um, pure birds in, in, in the Bible. If he can look after the dirtiest birds and look after wild flowers, he can look after you. That's the first thread. We need to be logical about it. If God can look after them, we see them thriving and being okay, he can surely look after you. Second thread is about uh, the fact that worrying doesn't change anything. Verse 25, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? 
Since you cannot do this very little thing, why worry about the rest? It's indisputable, isn't it? You can't really argue against that. Mark Twain said, I'm an old man and I've known a great many, of tr many troubles, most of which have never happened. I came across this story about Arthur Rank, who um, Rank Films, a huge um, philanthropist, he was a Christian man, and um, he uh, decided that he was going to have all of his worrying done on one day a week. And so he chose Wednesdays, and so he had a worry box, and he would just write down um, the worry that he had, and he put it in the worry box for Wednesday, and um, just not really worry about it. He said, on Wednesday, I'm going to sort that out. It's going to be fine. So on Wednesday, he would open the box and look at all the things, and he'd find that actually almost all of them had been sorted. It's interesting. He didn't need to worry. Be logical. Thirdly, be faithful. Look at verse 29. Do not set your heart on what you will eat and drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them. He knows about your needs. So what should we do? Verse 31. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Seek his kingdom, and he will look after you. The kingdom. What is the kingdom? It's the place where the king reigns. The king is Jesus. The kingdom of God is where Jesus is reigning. And the Bible talks about um, uh, the kingdom coming a little bit now, and it's going to come fully in the future. So there's a little aspect of the now. We see some of the kingdom now. And we're going to see it fully, not yet, but in the future. So whenever you see someone who is, when you pray for someone, they're healed. The kingdom of God has come. When you see injustice addressed, the kingdom of God has come. When there's a stranger who is given food, the kingdom has come. When um, an enemy of yours, when you make friends, the kingdom has come. If you seek the kingdom, Jesus says you will find it. If you want to seek a solution to anxiety, seek the kingdom, seek him, and you will solve that problem of anxiety. When it comes to anxiety, be obedient, be logical, be faithful. If you don't deal with anxiety, if you don't deal with worry, you are going to have a miserable life. So if Jesus talks about how to lead an unfulfilled or kind of um, a, um, uh, yeah, an unfulfilled life, if he's talked about leading a miserable life, thirdly, he talks about how to lead a fulfilled life, how to lead a contented life. And we see this um, being worked out. He says, first of all, see the generosity of the Father. Look at verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Don't be afraid. Fear doesn't even come into it. When you're seeing the generosity of the father, there's no fear involved. For your father has been pleased. He's been planning this. Um, he's been planning for good things um, to happen to you. And he's been doing it for a long time. And he is absolutely delighted about it. Your father is, has been pleased to give you, to give. He is a generous God who gives and gives and gives. He wants to stir up that giving in you. He's been planning to give you the kingdom. The kingdom, a new life with God. God in charge, where everything is better than anything we could do on our own. Everything is better than anything we could do on our own. So he says, first of all, see the generosity of the Father. Secondly, in this, he's, he encourages us to turn from idols or turn idols, our idols, into blessings. Look at verse 33. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Sell your possessions. He's um, talking here about the things that we own that almost own us. If you want to solve your problem with greed, the way to solve that is to give stuff away. 
But it's more than that. Jesus is advocating and encouraging that each one of us is generous. Each one of us gets into the habit of giving away. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. There are people who need your generosity. But the emphasis is not so much on the poor, it's on you selling your possessions. That's the most difficult bit. And it is a radical revolution when um, we allow God into our finances. When we allow God to look at what we spend, what we save, and what we give. We're encouraged to do all those things. We need to do those things, spending, saving, and giving. But I want to encourage us not to keep it hidden. If you are struggling in any of those areas, um, there's a Living Smart course coming up in February, which I commend to you. It's going to be run by Jackie Driver. Um, the money management team are going to be running it. And um, it's going to be a fantastic thing. So book on to that if you'd like to. Living Smart in 2013. But um, uh, one of the other things we want to encourage is every one of us to take up a stewardship account. Well, I'm going to be writing to you in the week about this by email. But we want to transfer our standing orders into stewardship um, accounts. Uh, and that means that you're able to have a lot more control over what's given. You can give to different things as well. And it's going to help the church to be able to manage giving too. But that's something that actually if you haven't started giving to the church, book onto stewardship and start to do that. More about that in the next few weeks. But I want to tell you about um, a guy called Toby Ord. This is him. Um, he lives in Oxford, and um, he is a, um, well, he was a PhD student. He um, has an income of, uh, is a research guy, and he's got an income of around 33,000. He decided a couple of years ago that he wanted to give one million pounds of his own money to charity in his life. He decided that he was going to set a benchmark of 18,000 pounds to live on, and he was going to give the rest away. Something like this, £5,000 went on rent, £4,000 on living expenses, the other 9000 went on tax, on um, uh, holidays, and on um, his uh, savings towards a house in the future. £18,000. He has already given £25,000 away. He's continuing to, he's set his mind on doing that. And what's he into? Well, this is what he says. Um, when I was earning 14,000 as a student, I found, I don't know many students who earn 14,000 anyway, but he was. Um, I found I was in the richest 4% in the world, and, um, earning 14,000 pounds. Even adjusting for how much further money goes in developing countries. Giving away 10% of that, I found that I would still be in the top 5%. And so he and his wife made this covenant. They've made a, a promise to themselves they're going to keep doing this, giving everything above £18,000. And um, he said this, what's really important in our lives is spending time together, chatting with close friends, reading beautiful books and listening to beautiful music. There's someone whose priorities are on people and on enjoying the things that um, uh, he has around him. He's made that decision, to, that radical decision, not to be bound by what he has, but to turn what could have been an idol into a blessing. Thirdly, we see after the seeing the generosity of the Father turning idols into blessings, Jesus encourages us to set your heart on God. What a great way to use 2013. These last words, verse 34. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't know if you've heard of Henry Thornton. Here's a picture of Henry Thornton. He was um, in uh, the William Wilberforce film that uh, came out a few years ago, Amazing Grace. And um, not many people know much about him in normal life. There's actually, in the banking world, he's known because he was one of the um, proponents of modern-day banking, how we uh, bank today in terms of the way it, when it works well. So he, was, um, he developed a 19th-century monetary theory that is actually still um, praised today for what he developed. And he was one of the founders of the Clapham sect, 
Clapham sect was a group of um, seven, uh, a few more later on, people who got together. They lived in Clapham, and Wilberforce was amongst them. And they decided that um, they were going to start praying and, and acting towards social transformation in the United Kingdom. One of the most famous things they're known for was the abolition of the slave trade. But Henry Thornton was the brains behind the financial activity of that group. He was a banker himself, he was an economist. He was able to give a lot of what he had away. In fact, he made a decision that um, while he was a bachelor, he said, I'm going to give six-sevenths of my income away. As a result of that decision, um, he, amongst others, founded the Church Missionary Society, the Bible Society. Um, he um, set up Freetown in Sierra Leone, the first... Um, non-slave colony to be formed in Africa. He was responsible for the starting up of many, many social transformation initiatives in the 18th and 19th centuries because he made a decision to use what he had for the glory of God. He decided, I'm going to seek the kingdom with what I have. I'm going to give everything. I'm going to give my life to this. He suffered poor health. Throughout his life, it included things like insomnia, headaches, digestive complaints. But he set his heart on serving the poor and helping transform their situations. He never complained. Henry Thornton sought the kingdom with what he had. And Jesus says, if you want to be content, if you want to be content in 2013, if you want to be content with your life, Put God first in your heart. And let that spill out into every area of your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Henry Thornton. Thank you, Lord, for the way he invested himself in your kingdom. He threw his heart and soul into serving you. And we are able to see the fruit of that in his life, in the thousands and millions of people who have uh, come to Christ in Africa and in India and the Far East through the missionary societies that he helped set up. We see that in the way that banking was transformed in the 19th century. We see that in the ways that um, so many social initiatives were able to be funded and helped because of his generosity. We thank you for his heart after you. And we pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us to find contentment, to find our contentment in following you, in seeking first your kingdom, in bringing our worries to you and deciding to leave them with you. We pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us in 2013 to put you first in school, in college, in university, in our workplaces, in our homes, with our families, with our responsibilities. We want to put you first. And we pray for your help in this. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us and enable us to do this. In Jesus' name, amen.